Okay, thanks for introduction. <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, Jun Sakuma from University of Tsukuba, Japan. Today, I'd like to talk about AI security <clears throat> and privacy. So, as in the last panel session, uh, as many of the panelists mentioned, uh, both industries and academia already have a huge amount of data. So we would be able to extract valuable knowledge from data, uh, but unfortunately, uh, mainly due to privacy or confidentiality reason, uh, we will not be able to uh, extract valuable knowledge uh, because we cannot unify the distributed data into one place. So if we could resolve uh, privacy or confidentiality concern, we will be able to uh, unify isolated databases into one place and we can utilize the big data. And so which would contribute to produce new services for industries or also uh, contribute new scientific finding for academia too. So in this talk, I'd like to introduce two ways to organize and handle private data in a privacy preserving manner. Uh, one is uh, called differential privacy, uh, which is a technique based on uh, statistics. And the second one is called secure computation, uh, which is based on cryptographic techniques. <clears throat> so first, I'd like to introduce the concept of differential privacy. So Apple uh, introduced uh, differential privacy into iOS 10. Uh, to collect user personal information from smartphones. So some of you might hear about differential privacy. So what is differential privacy? So differential privacy is originally designed to disclose statistics computed from personal information in a privacy preserving manner. And the local differential privacy is a variant of differential privacy which is specifically designed uh, to collect, uh, um, to collect uh, personal information from a large number of uh, individuals. Um, let us consider a survey of user uh, activities uh, from smartphones uh, as an example. So here, uh, we suppose a data analyst is interested in um, which emoji do users uh, frequently use? And this question can be resolved if the data analyst can obtain all the uh, text messages of the users, but unfortunately, uh, this kind of uh, computation is um, uh, extraordinarily privacy invasive, so it's almost impossible to, this kind of, to conduct this kind of survey. So what we, do, what we do is to introduce uh, local differential privacy. Here, let the question of the uh, analyst be, did you use the face with heart marks uh, in your messages today? So if we ask this question to all users and for all uh, emojis, uh, we can complete the histogram of the emojis. And for this question, user answers uh, their, uh, their responses to the analyst through the local differential privacy mechanism. And here, the mechanism behaves like a biased coin. So let's say the user's response is yes. Then the local differential privacy mechanism uh, retains the answer to the analyst yes. Uh, with probability, for example, 0 0.7. And with probability 0 0.3, the mechanism flips the answer uh, to the analyst. So uh, from the perspective of privacy preservation, since what the analyst observes is randomized by the mechanism, uh, the analyst is not able to uh, identify what the true user answer is. So this is privacy preserving. But unfortunately, uh, since the responses are randomized, it seems to be difficult to know the true frequency of the, this emoji. 
uh, even if the response is randomized, uh, as long as the analyst is aware of how much the user's responses are randomized, and as long as the analyst is able to uh, collect information from a sufficiently large number of users, uh, it's not difficult to statistically estimate the true uh, frequency of the emoji. So thus, uh, by doing so, we can balance the privacy and the utility uh, of the data analysis. And the local differential privacy can be applied to more complicated survey. So suppose the analyst is interested in uh, training uh, machine learning models for phrase recommendation. And for the training, let's say the analyst requires a huge number of text messages of users. And of course, this is very privacy invasive, so it's difficult to attain, but uh, it becomes possible using local differential privacy. So in the, in the scenario, users can send their text messages through the local differential privacy, and by doing so, what the analyst see is the randomized text messages. But as I um, mentioned before, uh, as long as the analyst can collect information from a sufficiently large number of uh, population, uh, the analyst can statistically uh, obtain a correct machine learning model uh, by using statistical estimation. So we conducted a uh, machine learning with local differential privacy. And this is the results. So in this figure, the x-axis uh, represents the number of users. And the y-axis shows the prediction accuracy of the machine learning obtained. The blue line, this one, the blue line represents the prediction accuracy of the machine learning model are trained without considering privacy. And as we see here, as the number of population, as the size of the population increases, the prediction accuracy uh, is improved. And please look at the second one, the light blue line. So this line represents the prediction accuracy of the machine learning model uh, trained uh, through the local differential privacy mechanism. And as we see here, uh, as the population size is increased, the prediction accuracy also uh, improved. And when the size of the population is not that large, for example, when the number of users is 1,000, there is a large gap between the prediction accuracy of the model with privacy and the model without privacy. But if we have a large number of population, like uh, 30,000 users, uh, looking at here, the gap between the blue one and the light blue one becomes almost ignorable, which means that uh, we can attain the training of machine learning uh, with ignoring the cost for privacy. So this is what the Apple recently deployed for uh, iOS 10. And next, I'd like to introduce um, another uh, situation, uh, which is called a secure computation. <coughs> so let's say there are two companies, and both companies have a private database. And company A does not wish to disclose their data to the other company, and the company B does not wish to show their database to the other company either. So, um, but the both companies still wish to perform data analysis with the joint databases and share the result for their profit. And this problem seems to be uh, very difficult to solve, but by using some cryptographic technique, it becomes possible. For this, we use a homomorphic encryption. This seems a little bit uh, mathematic, but it's not difficult to understand, actually. So let's say um, A and B are integers. And uh, this shows a cipher text of A. And this is a cipher text of B. 
And if the encryption scheme uh, follows homomorphic property, uh, this figure shows that uh, the addition between cipher text can be performed without decryption. And the resulting cipher text uh, corresponding to a cipher text of A plus B. So this means that we can do computation over cipher text without decryption. And for multiplication, we can do the same thing. So using this homomorphic property, uh, we can perform data analysis uh, with preserving privacy perfectly. This shows um, demonstration of how we can do data analysis over cipher texts. Here, uh, we have three users, and each of user has a secret information. In this case, the amount of the savings. The first, so first uh, girl ha has an uh, 25K euro, and the second one has a 4K euro, and the last one has a um, 33K euro. Okay, and there are uh, secret information for them. And what the analyst wishes to learn is the average amount of the savings. And in the first step, they encrypt their secret number with homomorphic encryption. And let the cipher text be C1. And the remaining users do the same computation, C2 and C3. And all users send the cipher text to the analyst. And the analyst obtains C1, C2, and C3. So please remind that these values are all encrypted. So the analyst is not able to learn which uh, is, is not able to learn what the values are because they are all encrypted. But when the uh, cipher text, when the encryption scheme has a homomorphic property, the analyst can do some computation over the cipher text. So uh, when the analyst do this kind of computation, uh, this process corresponds to um, evaluating the summation of the all plain text and the resulting cipher text questing to the uh, total of the uh, amount of savings. <coughs> so by, the, by doing so, the analyst is able to do uh, any computation desired uh, without learning what the individual values are. So using this, uh, we can do secure outsourcing of data analysis. So in the first step, the entities having a private data encrypt their data with homomorphic encryption and upload it to a cloud server. And the analyst who wishes to do some data analysis issues a request of analysis to the cloud server. And cloud server performs uh, some computation specified by the analyst and returns the result. And what's important here is that the results of the analysis is also encrypted. So uh, which means that the cloud server cannot learn anything about the input or the output. And after finishing all the computation, the analyst can decrypt the result to obtain the results of the data analysis. This is a procedure for the, of the secure outsourcing. And uh, recently, our research group applied this technology to uh, genetic testing for common diseases. So this is the uh, scheme for genetic testing for common diseases. Uh, for genetic testing, uh, we need to, the, a subject need to investigate the personal genetic information. And by assessing the personal genetic information, um, <coughs> we can learn the risk of the common diseases. For example, uh, if a people, uh, if an individual has a certain kind of genetic information, because of the, that genetic factor, that person may have a high risk for hypertension, but may have a lower risk for, for diabetes or something like that. And of course, uh, by investigating the geno personal genome, uh, we can learn the risk for common diseases. But uh, of course, um, 
common disease, the risk of the common diseases are highly affected by clinical or environmental information. For example, body mass index or blood pressure or how often the subject takes alcohol, uh, how often uh, the subject takes fatty food or something like that. So to precisely evaluate risks of common diseases, we need to investigate genetic information and clinical information of the subject. And usually the genetic information is investigated by a genetic testing agency and the clinical information is of course uh, accumulated in a hospital. So to investigate the uh, risk of common diseases, we need to combine the information taken at the genetic agency, genetic testing agency, and uh, <coughs> information taken in the hospital. But to do that, the hospital need to disclose the patient information to outside, or the genetic testing agency need to submit the patient's genetic information to outside. And in addition, someone need to combine the clinical and genetic information to assess the risk. And which is quite uh, privacy invasive. So what we did is to introduce homomorphic encryption uh, to resolve the security concern. This is an information flow conducted by our research group. <coughs> so when a patient uh, visit the hospital, the doctor uh, investigates the uh, clinical information of the subject and encrypt it on the local devices and submit it to the cloud server. And also the blood sample of the patient is shipped to a genetic testing agency. And the genetic testing agency uh, investigates the, the patient uh, genetic information, encrypt it, and upload it to the server. And the server uh, combines the clinical information and the genetic information of the patient and do the risk evaluation of the patient. And here, we would like to emphasize that all the information of the patient is encrypted. So the cloud server is not able to learn anything about the information of the patient. And after finishing the evaluation, risk evaluation, the risk is uh, submitted to the uh, local device of the hospital in an encrypted home. And the hospital locally decrypt the resulting risk uh, locally and show and show the risk to the patient and give some advice for uh, prevention of common diseases. So here uh, I introduced two ways to organize and handle uh, private information. The first one is uh, differential privacy or formally local differential privacy uh, which allows us to collect user information uh, even, even when the, <coughs> uh, only when the population is sufficient, sufficiently large. Uh, we can have a statistical, we can do some statistical survey over the users. And the second one is a secure computation, which allows us to do um, computation over joint databases, uh, consists of a personal or a private information. Okay. So in the first half of the topic, uh, first, first half of the talk, I uh, introduced uh, privacy enhancing technologies. And in the latter half of the talk, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, security and privacy of artificial intelligence as an emerging topic. So this is the information flow of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence. Uh, machine learning consists of two phases, training and prediction. So in the training phase, the machine learning algorithm uh, takes as input a large number of training samples. And a training sample uh, consists of a data and corresponding label. So in an example of face recognition, 
a training a sample consists of a face image and the identity of the face. <clears throat> so in this case, a bulb, uh, this picture is a face image and the bulb is the identity. And the machine learning model takes a set of training examples and produces a model that maps an image into a, a name of the uh, face. And after, uh, after the training, uh, we can perform some prediction. So given a face image without a name, the machine learning model gives a name of the identity of the face. This is a prediction phase. So in the laboratory, as long as the machine learning is, is, uh, is trained with a sufficiently large number of training samples, uh, it gives a correct prediction. But if the uh, artificial intelligence is deployed into the real world, uh, the, the system needs to interact with uh, various uh, entities. And we, need, we have to be aware that such kind of entities may often have a malicious, malicious intention uh, to affect and control the result of the artificial intelligence in an arbitrary way. So, uh, what we need is uh, we need to aware that the adversary might try to control the behavior of our artificial intelligence in a malicious way. And one famous example of an attack against artificial intelligence is called adversarial example. Uh, in this attack, the adversary maliciously uh, tries to modify test data so that the prediction result is controlled as the uh, adversary wanted. So this figure represents the concept of ad image adversarial example. The left leftmost figure uh, looks like, uh, of course, panda for humans. And the, this figure is recognized as panda also by a machine learning model. And the figure in the center is an adversarial perturbation. And this noise is uh, crafted uh, so that it is recognized as a different animal by the machine learning model. So if we add this noise, this noise to this panda picture, we have uh, this picture. And for humans, this picture still looks like panda. But if we give this uh, picture to AI model, it recognizes as a um, um, uh, gibbon. This is a different animal from a panda. So this is called adversarial example. And this is an, another demonstration of adversarial example. So these pictures look like stop for human, while the artificial intelligence recognizes this stop sign as a speed limit. If you look this figure carefully, you may find a, a specific pattern on the road sign. You see uh, black and white rectangles on the uh, road sign. So because of uh, this uh, characteristic, characteristic pattern, the machine learning recognize this uh, stop sign as a speed limit. And so if automobile cars recognize this uh, stop sign as a speed limit, this would uh, cause a serious traffic uh, accident. So uh, at this moment, the adversary example is very famous uh, for uh, an attack to artificial intelligence. But unfortunately, nowadays, we have a lot of research papers about adversarial examples, but we have a very small uh, number of papers for defenses against adversarial examples. So maybe in the next three, four years, we need to, uh, we need to study more about defenses against adversarial examples. And recently, uh, we developed an audio adversary example over there. <clears throat> uh, 
um, audio adversary example is an attack on uh, audio response systems such as smartphones or uh, smart speakers. So the concept of the audio adversary example is almost the same as image adversary example. So I'm gonna show some uh, demonstration. <laughs> So this is an regular sound. So for humans, we recognize this as a music. And of course, the uh, machine learning model, we employed a deep speech model, which is a state, state of the art of the speech recognition system. And this model recognizes this as nothing, because this is a music. And we add a noise, adversarial noise, which is carefully uh, crafted uh, so that the resulting example is recognized as a certain type of voice command by the deep speech. And we add the noise to the uh, original audio sample. And this is the resulting sound. <laughs> So you may sound a certain amount of noise in the sound, but I think you still recognize this as a music. But if I play this sound in front of the uh, deep speech model, it recognizes as hello world. <coughs> so uh, this can pose some certain risks. So in this case, we uh, made this audio adversary example specifically for uh, deep speech. But if we make this adversary example specifically for iPhone, uh, by playing this audio in this uh, room, your iPhone may react. So this is very um, uh, security intensive. And what, what, what's risky for audio as an adversary example is that an audio signal has a higher diffuseness. For example, if we uh, play an audio as an adversary example on a speaker, or even we can play an audio adversary example uh, on a TV program or radio program, uh, a huge number of mobile devices or smart speakers can react with audio adversary examples. So um, at this moment, what we did is just attacking. So in the future, we need to establish some methods to defense uh, that resist to audio ad adversary example. Okay, so next I'd like to introduce another attack against artificial intelligence, which is called uh, model inversion. So in this attack, the adversary tries to extract training samples from a pre-trained neural network models. So if the model is trained with a private or confidential information, it can cause a privacy violation. Technologies that use artificial intelligence have an increasing role in people's daily lives. Such AI applications include facial recognition for unlocking devices. The Japanese researchers warned that the technology is not the ultimate form of online security, as some developers claim. NHK World's Yoshitaka Hirauchi has more. Some of the latest smartphones use facial recognition technology instead of passwords or fingerprints. This machine at American hamburger chain recognizes customers' faces and recommends menu items based on past purchases. The facial recognition system is expected to have wider applications for ID checks around the world. But Japanese researchers have found that the technology can pose security risks. 
They did an experiment in which they put data of a person's face into an AI system and then tried to hack into it using similar technology. Researchers created a series of dummy faces and showed them to the system. They tried to learn how the system recognized the faces as fake, then made them closer to the original. This learning process was repeated many times. After two days, they came up with an image that fooled the system. So this is a result of our uh, research group. And what we employed here for this attack is called generative adversarial networks. The generative adversarial network consists of two modules. One is called generator, which is a neural network that tries to generate fake images that look like real. And the other module is called discriminator, which is a neural network that tries to discriminate uh, fake images from a uh, real one. And the generative adversarial network uh, uh, trains a model uh, with a competitive training of these two neural networks. And in the beginning, the generator uh, cannot uh, make photorealistic images. So it simply generates uh, this kind of very noisy images. So the discriminator can easily distinguish the generated images from the real images. But as the training proceeds, the images generated by the generator uh, becomes more uh, photorealistic. And in the end, it becomes very photorealistic. So with using this kind of technique, uh, we generated face images that is recognized as a face recognition system. And we finally revealed what kind of faces can be recognized as a specific person. So this video shows the training process of the uh, attack. So the target is the keen leaves. And first, it looked like, look like a different person. But as the training process proceeds, it converges to a face that looks like keen leaves. But what's interesting here is that all these faces are fake. They are, look like keen leaves, but there's no photos uh, of can, can leaves like this. OK, so let me summary this talk. Uh, in the first half of the talk, uh, I introduced two uh, privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, one is differential privacy to collect uh, information from users in a privacy preserving way based on statistical techniques. And the second one is called secure computation uh, with homomorphic encryption, uh, which allows us to uh, perform computation uh, over distributed databases uh, without uh, disclosing uh, private data. So I would like to emphasize that <coughs> the secure computation is um, useful tools to process computation over private data. But you know, um, we have to establish legal system to uh, process private data with a secure computation. So as long as the information is encrypted, it's not clear if it is still personal information or not. And in a Japanese legal system, even if the personal information is encrypted, it is still personal information. So you know we can not do secure computation over uh, organizations. So recently, <coughs> Japanese government has started to started to discuss how we can reconcile the recent technology advances in crypto system and the legal system uh, about personal information. And in the second, the latter half of the talk, I introduced uh, two major risks, risks of artificial intelligence. One is adversarial examples, and the other is model inversion. And as I said, the artificial intelligence has been recently uh, developed very rapidly, and it has a very high recognition ability, and that is even uh, better than <coughs> recognition ability of a human. 
but there are still vulnerabilities in the recognition ability of uh, AIs. And using that vulnerabilities, so we can uh, design several kinds of attacks. So what we need to in the next two or three years is how we can uh, generate AIs that resist to this kind of attacks. Okay, so this is the end of talk, thanks. <laughs>